Tell me when you want me to start, Apostle. Oh, uh, yes, Apostle, you can start right now. Uh huh. Well, well, well. Thank the Lord and, and thank God for all the kind words and and I want to say this. I am nervous, nervous, nervous. My last name is Sigue. It's S I G U E, and most people say it with the Q, but it's the G. Uh, and I just want to thank God for being here tonight. Can I ask everyone to please turn? Because I'm nervous. I don't know where to start, where not to start. So I'm going to first of all ask y'all to pray for me. And then I'm going to ask everyone to please turn to Revelations to check the sixth chapter. And as we get ready to talk about uh, the sixth chapter, I'm going to perhaps ask a few questions. Something that normally when I'm trying to do whatever I'm trying to do tonight I don't generally start out with questions. I really wait and, and go into whatever I'm doing. And then I ask the questions, but because uh, we have all these uh, theologians and, and apostles and, and doctors and all on the, on the line, I figure, well, we can just go ahead on and we can kind of start out with the question. And my first question that I want to start out with in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations is, what is it really called? The what, and, and what do I mean by what do I mean by what is this chapter really called? This chapter has a specific name to it. Uh, now I'm not talking. We know that we're dealing with the seven. And it says seven seals, but actually we're only dealing with six seals. And I like the fact that we're dealing with six because six is the number of man. And so I, I kind of like that as well. I like. To to deal with numbers. And so as we're going here, we won't go into the seventh. The seventh seal doesn't even start until you get to the eighth chapter. But what again is this sixth chapter called? Can someone tell me what is it called? And then my next question is why do you think that it's called that? Hmm. Okay. It's called the Great Tribulation. The sixth chapter of Revelation is called the Great Tribulation. And, and why is it called that? It's not because it's tribulation, because we go through many trials. We go through many tests. We have many tribulations in our lifetime. But they call this, the sixth chapter of Revelation, the Great Tribulation, because of the different events that take place here in this particular chapter. So well, we, we want to thank God again. Uh, I'm going to ask you all again to bear with with me because I am uh, somewhat nervous. I don't know why I do this often, but tonight I am extremely nervous. Uh, so let us go ahead on. And then I'm going to ask you if someone uh, would begin to read for us, please, starting at the first verse. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a, mm. a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Mm. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, I me a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked 
and behold, pale, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held and they cried with a loud voice saying how long O lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth and white robes were given unto every one of them and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were were should be fulfilled and i beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood mm. and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain island was moved out of their places. You want me to continue? Yeah, you, you might as well. You only got uh, a few more verses now, so please. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid part of the, excuse me, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Mm. Well, we thank you. Thank you so much for the reading. And let's go back for a few minutes. Let's go back to chapter four. In chapter four, it was talking about God the Father uh, and how he was presented unto the king of heaven and how he was so worthy uh, to receive power and honor and glory because he created all things. Now, in chapter five, you know, I, I, chapter five, like I guess like it did with everyone else, when John began to the talk, and he's seen that no man was worthy to, to even open this seal. But listen, uh, we talked to talking about a seal and talking about, I, I looked it up, and I'm sure most of you already know this, but what, what, how was it sealed? What, how come no man could really open this thing? But I looked it up, and I seen what, a, a, how a, what the scrolls are and how the scrolls is just rolled up. And what it did is have strings that's tied all around it. And what they did was they took this wax and they poured the wax over the string so that it could get hard. And then what I saw with my eyes, it looked like it was six or seven buttons. We're going to say six because, again, we are dealing with the seals. We are dealing with the six seals. So we saw, what, uh, to my eyes, it looked like buttons in the string went around the buttons to make sure that it was sealed so that no man, no man can get in it. And how John, again, in the fifth chapter, how John, he was so hurt that he could see no one actually nobody that he could find that was worthy to open the seal. But as we go into the sixth chapter, things begin to change. Things begin to change. Now, again, you would think that the number five, which means grace, <clears throat> that's what the number five is, is God's grace, is unmerited favor. You would think they would have started something then, but God really, whether we accept this or not, is still true. God really don't do anything on earth without us anymore, without mankind. So we thank him for that. So he used man again at this time, though he used his only begotten son. Now in the sixth verse, he started, I'm sorry, in the sixth chapter, the first verse he began to talk about. Now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come. He had a very heavy voice. And he told him, he said, come on here. I want to show you something. I want you to see something. Now, when we talk about, can anybody very quickly tell me who is or what is these beasts, these living creatures? Who 
what was that? I'm not going to ask you what each one represents. We're not going to go into that because he was talking about when I say he, I'm talking about uh, Dr. Short. He didn't want us to go verse by verse. He just wanted us to try to summarize it. So that's what I'm going to do. But I do want you uh, to see who can really tell me who was or what was these uh, creatures, these four creatures here that they were talking about, these living creatures that he was talking about here in verse one. I'm guessing nobody, huh? Well, all right then. Well, we're gonna go ahead on. The first one was a lion. Then it was an ox. Then it was a man. And then the next one was an eagle. And if we do any kind of studying at all in the book of Ezekiel, it would really help us kind of look through this. It would help us find out um, a little bit more about these four, but we're not talking about these four. Let's, let's go on to the next. Let's go on to this horse. Can somebody tell me who was this person sitting on this white horse that had a bow and he had a crown it was given to him and he went out conquering and he went out conquer can someone tell him tell me please who was this person that was sitting on this horse or who do you think it is the antichrist thanks right here yeah. all right someone said uh, uh someone said the antichrist uh, anybody else I also think Antichrist. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, baby. Uh, I also agree, Antichrist. It was the Antichrist. All right, anybody else? I agree. Okay, it seems that everybody agrees, agree. and it is true. I'm just, I'm not really surprised because we have masters in this class going for your doctors and so far and so on. So I'm not really surprised that everyone seemed to know that it is the Antichrist. But there was a time when I thought that it wasn't the Antichrist. There was a time when I honestly thought it was Christ. But now we all know that it is the Antichrist that was on this horse. He came out pretending, trying to act like uh, who he was. He was trying to deceive. Just to let us know one thing, and this is for sure. Everything, what they say, everything, I, I wish I could think of that scripture, but I, it's not a scripture. It was a saying that everything shine ain't gold. Everything that glitters is not gold. That's it. Everything that glitters is not gold. Thank you. <laughs> but that's exactly what it is. You can look at people sometimes and you could think, one thing and you could be altogether wrong because people want you to see what they want you to see. And when they want you to see something really good and they want you to see most of the time for right now, that's what you see. And when he got on that horse, that's what he wanted because he wanted to conquer. He wanted to win. He wanted to get people in on his side, This the Antichrist. So we just thank God. Now, as we go down to, let's go ahead on down again. I said that we was not going to, that we was not going to go uh, from uh, verse to verse, and we're not. But listen, we're gonna go here to the to the red horse here, or uh, to the red uh, where what is it says here three and four, the rider on the horse. Uh, I'm sorry, my this is really small and plus. Like I said, I'm very very nervous too. But I was reading somewhere where it talked about this this white horse also symbolized uh, politics. Can you believe it? It also symbolized, and the reason why I say, can you believe it, is because when we were talking and we were being taught, we were taught that uh, those that was on the Isle of Patmos, uh, they were there on that island because basically it was political that they were there. It was different things. They hadn't really, on this island, they hadn't really killed people. They hadn't really did all of this stuff, but it was basically political. And I had read someplace uh, where, it was really political. And this is what this, some of what this white horse was all about. So again, let us just, just go on for a minute uh, here as we're going here and it says the rider on, on the horse, we're talking now about the red horse. Again, we're going down here. I look and behold, uh, no, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. And another horse, fiery red went out and it was granted to the one who set on it to take peace from the earth, that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Again, we're talking about, this is why they call this the great tribulation, because we are talking about the different things that went on. We're talking about now this horse here. He, he 
comes out now, he comes to kill. That also makes me think of this time the way it is now. There's so much death. I know in my lifetime, I'm 70 some years old, and I know I've never seen so much death, so much killing, so much this going on as we see now, even though I understand that there, as we was taught that it was not now that he was talking about, but nevertheless, it feels like to me, that this horse was let loose right about now. And then he talked about the rider on the black horse. Now this, this symbolized what? Uh, uh, economical problems. Again, something like I think that we are getting ready to have right now. There is going to be famine in the land where people can't eat. I believe they were telling about all of these people now that's getting double uh, like the food stamps that they ever had gotten before. And people were thinking this was a mistake. I said, I don't think it's a mistake. The government don't make mistakes like this. They know that it's something getting ready to take place on the face of this earth. Now, I don't know if this is true. I'm just saying what came to my head, what came to my mind. And what came to my head and what came to my mind was even back in the day uh, when I believe it was a uh, Pharaoh, when, uh, when Joseph had the dream. And when he had the dream, it was seven years of famine and then seven years of plenty. And now I think this is our seven years of plenty. I think God is just overflowing us. I think the people now, all of us, I think we need to learn how to can foods. I think we need to learn how to put up water. I think there's things now that we really need to, this again, as Dr. Short would say, this is my opinion. This is the way I feel, that the way I believe that's what's going on and what's going on now. Because you look at this second wave of the coronavirus that have come through. This second wave is even more deadlier, deadlier than the first. And after a while, before, they stopped us somewhat so from going into stores. But I believe they are going to close down stores now. I believe now we're not even beginning to see the things that's going to happen upon the face of this earth. Because we have to remember this much as well. Also, remember, we're talking about the Great Tribulation, but we're also talking about a judgment period. Don't think that during this judgment period that God himself is not. God is the one that's getting ready to actually do this. God is the one uh, that punishes. God is the one that don't let us get away. We think that we might be able to get away. We think that we might be able to get by, but I don't believe that. I don't believe that we get away with our sins. I believe that God, our sins really do catch us up with us. I believe, and I don't care what it is, there's a price that we pay. Jesus paid for our sin. Jesus paid the price for us. Jesus went to the cross for us. And don't you know <clears throat> that we don't get away with anything? And these people thought that they were going to actually get away, but they were not getting away. This was yet, again, the great tribulation. This here was judgment. These seals that they was unwrapping was, was judgment being unwrapped before the people because of what they have done. Nobody else. They were the one that uh, don't believe. They were the one that didn't believe in Jesus. What is one of the greatest sins that we can have? Exactly. If you think about sin, uh, back in my day, they used to say smoking and drinking and and fornication and all that stuff was the biggest sins. But can somebody tell me, what do you really think the biggest sin is today? Not believing in God. Not believing in God. And, and I want to ask another question, saints. What, what is it that y'all are not answering me? You can't tell me that you all don't know because I know you do know. But can you tell me why you're not answering these questions? Uh, I, I really would like to know because I know you know. But nevertheless, let us just go on anyway. But not believing in God, I think the greatest sin is not believing in Jesus Christ, not believing in God's son, that he sinned, that he sent his only begotten son into this world. He did. He sent him. He took on our sins for us. He went to the cross for us. And for us to deny him, for us to act like he do not exist, act like he's not real, I don't believe it's going to work. As a matter of fact, I know it's not going to work. But as we go on, let us go on really quickly. And then uh, we're going to turn it over to our beloved sister, Sister Myra. Now, we were just talking about that red horse. And we were talking about the black horse and what it symbolized. So we just thank God, even as we just go on here, just, uh, 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 what was it? let's go to seven and eight. Well, let's go to the pale horse, which is a yellowish a green color, and it represents diseases, it represents death, it represents Haiti. Uh, it's, 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 it's the grave. <laughs> now, over a fourth, now we're talking about over a fourth of this land, so many people 
they are just dying. So many people think that, you know, you could take some of these here and it seemed like to me, we can kind of even put them together. We're talking about death. We're talking about hell. We're, we're talking about judgment. We're, we're talking about the great tribulation. We're talking about opening up the seals to what God is really going to do next. Now let us go ahead on as we were talking about that. Let's talk about verses nine. We're going to go through verses nine to 11. Now, and we're talking about these people, when they came, when all of this stuff came upon them, when or they began to run and they began to hide, they didn't know what to do, saying they didn't know how to do it. They was actually terrified. They wasn't afraid. They were actually terrified. They was just terrified of, of everything. They, they really was. They knew that something was going on. They knew a raft was coming. They knew that the son of God, they knew this, but yet, but yet they wouldn't accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal savior. They was afraid. I have people sometimes today, they will cry and they will say things, but they won't, they won't accept Christ as their Lord and savior. They won't give in to the Lord. They'll give in to everything else the same way as they did right here, the same way if they doing it. Yes, I'm kind of skipping so that we can go on, but I'm telling you, but the same way they did here is what they really do now. The same identical thing. We won't say yes to the Lord. We won't give in to the Lord. We will give everything, but we won't give in. We won't give ourselves over to God. What is it that we think that we want and that we need so very badly, much so much more than what we need God? Now, I think I heard something, I don't know if it was my phone or not, but, but I think what we need to do is really just give ourselves and give everything that we have over to God, but not these people. These people ran, they ran under the mountains, they ran under the rocks, they ran everywhere trying to escape, but even the rocks cried out, there is no hiding place. And I thought of that word, you know, he asked us to give us, he asked us if we would uh, find a nugget in here. And I, I, you know, I kept on going through and I kept on and I kept trying to find a nugget and I couldn't find a nugget. And then after a while, I really did. I, I that, that word rock, it just kept coming at me and it really did. And I wanted to understand why. And so then I just thought about it for a few moments. And I thought about the rock and I thought about how man was made uh, from dirt and where does rocks come from? Rocks are made from dirt. I thought about how um, you know, there's a scripture that talk about the rocks. Now, not the same scripture here that we're talking about now, because when he said there is no hiding place, but they ran, they ran to hide. They ran to, to get up under the rocks. They ran to get up. I'm trying to get here to this last couple of verses. I want to read this. I want to see it just kind of, I found this uh, somewhat funny. I found this how they were trying their very best to get away from the Lord. They was trying their best to get away. So they ran, they, they needed some shelter. So what did they do? They, they ran, they ran under the thing that they was trying to get away from. They ran under the rock. They ran up under Jesus. They ran because Jesus is the solid rock. Jesus is the one and they ran up under him and they wanted the rocks to fall out on them. They wanted the rocks to hide them. The same ones that they were hiding from, they wind up running to. Isn't that something? That's the way it is. Even with us today, we need to run to and not from. We like to run from, but we don't know where we are running to. Now we need to learn how to run to the rock. And Jesus is the rock. What did he tell Peter? He Hallelujah. Said, I, build I build my church in the gates of hell. So now prevail against him. He was talking, look, he's talking about himself. He is that solid rock. That's who Jesus is. And so my, my key word was rock. And, and that's what I, uh, that's what I liked. And I just, again, thank God for these six seals that they were open up and the things that really uh, took place as he opened up and as they began to open up these six seals. And, and let's not forget, because I think it was very, very, very important here when after he did open up the six seals, what did he do? What did he actually do after he opened it up? He turned around and he, he put them on a robe, glory be to God. And then he put them on a robe and a robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants 
and their brethren who would be killed as they was completed. There's a time when we got the rest in God. There's a time when we, when God got everything already taken care of. God knows when, what, and how, and he knows where. And sometimes we want things yesterday and God is saying, no, just relax, just wait, I got this. And that's what he was telling them, put these robes on that I have already given you, these robes that I have made for you. Put these robes on. I want you to relax. I want you to wait. Wait on your sisters. Wait on your brothers. Wait on those that are are coming after you. It might seem like a long time coming, but it's not. It's not a long time coming at all. I got this. Trust me. And that's what we find. I believe that's what we find so hard to do is to trust the Lord. And so he says, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? The great day of his wrath is come. Who is able to stand? And sixteen and and said to the mountain and to the rocks, fall on us and hide from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. They was hiding from the lamb. They was hiding from the rock, but yet they went right to the rock. I tell y'all, it's no, there's no hiding place. When we run, we better run straight to the rock. Thank you all. Amen. Wow. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. Um, okay, before we go to Sister Myra, does anyone have any questions at this time? Okay, uh, I do want to ask because I, I believe I didn't miss it. In verse two, Apostle, what did you say the explanation was the reason why he had a bow and no arrow? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I had you muted out. I really did not. I didn't give an explanation for that at all, Dr. Short. I kind of went right past, past it. Okay. All right. I, I, I just, I'm not going to ask the question. I just, let me just go ahead and explain it because it is important. Um, I, I, I believe you might elaborate on the fact that he was on the white horse. The white horse and uh, the lack of an arrow is part of the anti-crisis deception up, uh, upon the earth. We understand that the first, um, the, again, I think Apostle might have mentioned the Great Tribulation, but the Great Tribulation is actually the last part of the tribulation period. The tribulation period is a succession of seven years. It's only the last part of the seven years or the last three and a half years, which is called the great tribulation. So we want to make sure that we're not calling everything the great tribulation. The great tribulation is only the last half of the tribulation period. The first Mm -hmm. three and a half years, the Antichrist comes to deceive. So therefore, what he does, as I think it was might have been mentioned, he, he uses a white horse because, you know, they, in later chapters, Jesus comes upon a white horse. So that is to deceive. But the fact that he has a bow with no arrow and it says that he goes forth to conquer and to conquer tells us only about one thing. His conquering is not going to be done with, by force. He's going to be able to articulate, to communicate and to be able to to convince people to follow him, not because of he's conquering uh, with his hands. He's not a fighter. The Antichrist is not a, a fighter in that sense at this time. So more than likely, he's more than likely some great politician, some spokesman that's going to win the world through, through oral communication. That's why he has a, so the So the bow is nothing more but intimidation. But the real power in the Antichrist is going to come through his speech intimidation all right thank you okay so that's pretty much it anyone else have any questions comments or statements on chapter six mm-hmm. okay this time we're going to move on uh sister myra good evening class my name is myra skelton i'm so excited i'm going to put my heart in my chest and i'm going to keep going because it's like really bumping like crazy so i'm going to kind of recap <laughs> <laughs> recap Um, on some things that I learned um, as I went through revelations that I thought was really um, eye-catching to me and very knowledgeable. Um, But starting in chapter one, just going through just a recap, actually. um, Let me see here. Bear with me. 
Um, revelation, we know, is the unveiling of Christ, the revealing. Um, what I find it is it's, it's telling us all the secret things. It's revealing all the mysteries that we have read about all through the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Um, as we go through and what I've learned is also it is how he is really revealing himself in us and through us, um, breaking us out of our flesh, being revealed. So that's what I'm finding also in Revelations. Um, we went through the um, seven churches. So at the beginning of each church, it, it talks to an individual church, but when it ends and it says, he that hear, heareth an ear, hath, hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches, which is plural, which means anybody that comes across this knowledge and understand the prophecy that is being said, it is for you also. So going through every one of the churches is it's not just for that specific church, it's for anyone who has an ear. Um, what is a church? The church, um, the definition, you know, just digging down into it because of textual criticism, it is ecclesia. What is ecclesia? Ecclesia means the called out ones. So Israel were the called out ones. They were the called out ones to be called to God. So we are um, the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. We are not called out to men. We are not called out to ministry. We are called out to God. So going through the seven churches, it is for everybody. At the end of every one of the churches, they receive the promise. I'm pretty sure he didn't want just one church to receive that one pro promise. He wants us to receive the fullness of, which is all of him. Therefore, this is like the seven churches is like the completion of what um, I would say a classroom going through the grades. You got to go through first grade. You got to go through second grade. You got to go through third grade. Seventh grade is completion. So we have to go through this process to get to chapter four, five, and six. Um, All right, so I had typed up the promise. I had did a slide, you guys, some slides, but I I don't have to show it. The the promises we get, we have access. We can gain every single one of the promises as an individual church because it's speaking to us as individuals because we are an individual church. He doesn't judge us as a whole, but as individuals can receive all of these promises. Um, do anybody have any questions or comments as I move before I move forward? Any questions, comments? All right, I'll keep going. So um, I dug a little bit also in chapter four as I was moving to chapter seven because I'm going to continue to recap because we know what um, I just kind of went through the chapters. Um, Apostle kind of touched a little bit on the beast and I want to kind of break down the beast because the beast was very interesting to me and I really wanted to understand the four beasts. Not only that about number four, number four is giving us a picture, a visual of the throne and what's happening in the throne room. So if you read it, it's like one through seven and it says, after this, I look and behold, a door was open. So now y'all can, if you can envision, this door is open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard was, as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things, the things that must be hereafter. And immediately he was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So he's given us a picture, a visual of what it looks like in the throne room. Not only that, he breaks down, there's emeralds, there's all of these things in this throne room. So he painted this beautiful picture um, of jaspers, um, sardine stones and the rainbow and around the throne in sight like unto emeralds and around and about the throne were four and 20 seats. And he's telling you who's sitting there in the throne. So we're looking at like a courtroom, uh, uh, the throne room. So he's painting a picture. And I want you guys, when you read it, to look as if you're looking at a picture. So he goes on and he talks about the four beasts. 
So I break down the four, the four Bs. So he saw one that looked like a, a lion. What is the lion, you guys? The lion means dominion, royalty, power, splendor. It's telling us we have authority. So we know Christ had authority. He was authority. He was made to sit on the throne. He has authority. So the lion rep represents dominion, royalty, power, and splendor. So he saw another one that looked like a calf, or we can say a, an oxen. So what do we hear about um, in the Bible? Because all of what we've read or what I've read, it's, it's like a summary of the history book, a summary of the Old Testament. So what we are to do is read what just happened in, um, say, church number one, the first church of Ephesus or whichever one, and then go back and find it in the Old Testament and get all the details about really what we should do and what we should not do, because this is a book of examples of how we can get to this fullness and to this um, white robe. So it's a summary to me, um, two and three, of what um, we need to do, but we can go back and find it within the story, within our history book, and get all the details on each church, because it can really tell you the location of where all these things happened in the Old Testament. So, um, so the lion means dominion, royalty, power, splendor. So, and the reason why I'm talking about that, the calf, we remember Elijah, when he met Elisa, he was pulled pulling um like an ox it means servanthood so servanthood kind of balance out you know this royalty so we can't just be um these these men and women of authority because we will be off balance we will become prideful we will think okay um i don't have to do anything but with this it comes servants um to, we have to be a servant so we know Jesus was, he was royalty, he had authority, and he, more than anything, he showed that he was a servant, all right, um, man, Jesus was, he, he, he was human, he cried, he was hungry, he was thirsty, so mm. it's okay for us to show our human side, um, so that's what the man represents, that the human side of him, and the ego, is confidence. So all of these different classes, these different um, beasts gives a full picture of who was standing before God. So we have to be balanced in all these areas to be able to conquer what it is that God is building in us, which takes us to chapter seven. Um, God is building his army. So we're his mm -hmm. army. The 1,400 is the army that he's trying to seal. He's sealing us to fight for him. Um, chapter seven, and it says, after these things, I saw four angels standing on four corners of the earth, holding mm -hmm. the four winds of the earth and the wind and the four, holding, excuse me, now, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. So I um, looked up, you guys, the winds. And the east wind does a lot of damage, you guys. Okay. Um, so let me pull this up. Hmm. Come on, my you're doing great. The East Wind, you guys, it brings forth so much, um, so much stuff. You wouldn't believe what it what it brings. All right, so there's 19 scriptures that um, that is that the East Wind occurs in. The East Wind, um, just kind of summarizing it. It brings disaster, it brings famine, it brings locusts, it creates a pathway, it causes things to wither. Um, Genesis 41 and 6. Genesis 41 and 23, you guys know this is when um, Pharaoh had the dream of the seven, um, and behold, seven thin ears, and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. 
Genesis 41, 23, and behold, seven ears withered, withered thin and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And then Genesis 41, 27, and the seven thin and ill-favored kin that came up after them are seven years and seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. So as you can see, the east wind so far is bringing destruction. Um, There's sev several ones. Um, this one right here is when it parted the Red Sea. Um, Exodus 14 and 21, and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord causes the sea to go back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry made the sea and dry land and the waters were divided. So it caused division. It causes a pathway. Um, Job 15 and two. Um, I won't use that one. But there's 19 scriptures and I can send um, Dr. Short my slides and you can have all the scriptures that pertains to um, the East wind. And this is the last one I'm going to read. When Jonah, you guys, when Jonah... Um, four and eight. And, and it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a famine east wind and the sun beat upon his head and Jonah, uh, upon his head, on the head of Jonah and he fainted and he wished himself to be, um, to die. So I want to point that out because it comes at the end of chapter seven when it says we will thirst no more, we will hunger no more, nor will the sun beat us up. The west wind is only mentioned one time you guys and it brought forth a clean cleansing exodus 10 and 19 um not one locust was left in the coast of all of egypt so the west wind was only mentioned one time so it brought forth a clean cleansing which i thought was really really cool when you guys um it seems to bring forth peace it occurs seven times in the Bible, and Job is one of them when he says, how thy garments are warm when he quieteth the earth by the south wind. And then Psalms 78, 26, he said, it says, he causes an east wind to blow in the heaven, and by the power he brought in the south wind, um, it Ecclesiastics 1 and 6, the wind goeth towards the south and turneth about unto the north and withereth about and swirleth, excuse me, about continually and the wind returneth again according to its citrus. So it's like it sent another wind on the right path, which is the north wind. Um, so like I said, the south wind is mentioned seven times and then the north wind only occurs three times. And it really doesn't have a significance. So when I read chapter, going back to chapter seven, and it says, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it is given to hurt the earth and the sea saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, neither the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So I would assume after studying the wind that the east wind is the one who is sent to bring destruction because it, it brings a lot of destruction that so far what I have read. And sealing us, meaning that we know who we are. We know we are the called out ones. We know what we're supposed to do. We won't be deceived because we are so sealed that we won't wave, waver in our faith. We won't waver in anything. We'll, we're, we know that what we're going to do, we're going to do exactly what God has called us to do. And I found this um, other article on the 1000. 4400 4, and it says and it's just kind of given a roundabout and it says for good reason the end of the prophecy recognizes the incredible service and victory of the one 1400 
excuse me, 144,000 over Babylon and Lucifer, even though most, if not all of the 144,000 will be killed, they will accomplish everything that Jesus wanted them to do. They will faithfully say everything Jesus wanted them to say, and they will go wherever G Jesus sends them, not only during the great tribulation, but throughout eternity. So this is, this is God truly just preparing his 144 uh, for the great tribulation. He's sealing us. And then as we got, we know that it's telling us how many were sealed from each tribe. And then for moving on to the winds, I did write down to the names of the winds. Um, they're Greek and they're hard to pronounce. <laughs> but um Boris, B-O-R-E-A-S, is the north wind, the um, Greek god of the cold in the winter. The south wind, Notorus, N-O-T-O-S, -N -O -O um, more like the wet storm, bringing wind in the late midsummer, early autumn. Um, Eurus, E-U-R-U-S, is the east wind, is associated with the autumn. Um, mostly with the fall season. And then Zephyrus, Z-E-P-H-Y-R-U-S, the West is um, pretty much the spring. And any questions or comments before I continue? And I think I'm almost finished. All right. Um, the seal of the servant. Okay, so this is where the server keeps being sealed. I'm going to cover that. Any questions or comments? So here, right here from chapter nine on down, and this is pretty much where the sealed ones had made it to the throne or made it to their white robe. They made it through the great tribulations. Their, their robes are completely white. Um, and they made it, you guys. This is so. This is what I I have. I'm finished. So, if is there any questions or comments or any thoughts on anything that was said tonight? Uh, pretty much, in in pretty much. Okay, since you're doing chapter seven, is there a time period which this prophecy? Uh, uh, for for um for for fill, mm, for fulfillment excuse me um i saw only thing i saw on this was um considering the glory sense that it takes a place on 100 and 1265 day of the great tribulation on um that Sunday morning, Jesus was resurrected, but the number that I had, I had found was 1,267th day of the Great Tribulation. Okay. Um, okay. Um, uh, she's already asked, was there any questions, comments, or statements? I take it that no one has any questions, comments, or statements. And really, chapter seven, I mean, even if there's not any questions, there's... Uh, I think this is one of your most popular scriptures because it does reference, again, um, where most preachers may quote this, these are they that had gone through great trials and tribulations, um, and which is not to be confused with the tribulation period. Okay, so we don't want to confuse this scripture, uh, that that statement, you know, going through great trials and tribulations with the tribulation, with, with the tribulation period. Um, because a lot of this may reference at some point out to what the apostles suffered early on. Mm -hmm. And as we go back, the, the, actually, the last days actually started right during the apostles' time. Um, but I do want to go back over something that apostle said. I want to make sure I heard her correctly. Apostle, did you say that God can't do anything on earth without man? 
Did I hear that correctly? Mm -hmm. Was that her that said that? Who said, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Apostle, did you, did you say that? I'm, I'm quite sure you did. Okay, because I, I really want to discuss that. I hear that a lot. Well, I hear that from time to time, and I want to kind of force that in the National School of Theology. I don't want that in nobody's spirit. And I and so God, I want God hold me, I don't want him holding me responsible for that belief. Um, that is something that Miles Monroe and um, I can't think of the other preacher that Miles Monroe was on a talk show and he was speaking concerning and it was asked it was asked him a question and he responded again pretty much that. Uh, God needs man permission to do anything on earth. And I kind of wanted to squash that, that notion that God needs man, uh, period, because, and I'm not going to be long into it, but the Bible says, uh, one scripture is that, that when man don't know how to pray as he ought, it's the spirit of God that makes intercession and the behalf of man. So if God is depending on man's prayer, he's depending upon the most weakest thing upon the face of the earth because there are going to be a time, and there's times in our lives right now that we don't know how to pray. We, we go through some hell, and there's times we don't know what to say to God. There's times we're just weeping. There's times we just cry. But, he, the, but God sent the Holy Spirit to pray for us. So to say that God can't do nothing unless man gives him permission, please, man, we are without God. We're only saved by grace. We're not saved because of our wisdom. We're not saved because of our knowledge. We're saved because of the grace of God. Man. Uh, and so... Um, and then the other thing I think about, you know, when you get in trouble sometime and you can't pray and you're in a situation, you know, God sends angels. You know, the Bible said that God sends angels on a word. In other words, you didn't request it and you didn't know that God already moved in your behalf with, even without your request. So that's another thing to believe that God only moves when you pray. How about, you, God forbid that you're knocked out. God forbid that you're incapacitated. God forbid that you're, that you're under the, the doctor's needle and you can't pray. Amen. But we thank God that he, this is why we say that God is omniscient, all-knowing. This is why we say that God is omnipotent, all-powerful, all-powerful. The other thing, you know, I look in Romans 8. Uh, I'm gonna try to pull that up. Um, I think I, I quoted a while ago, Romans 8 and 26, if someone can find it real quickly for me. Um, Romans 8 and 26. But um, I think that's where it says that where man is not. Um, but then what also, you remember the danger of when Job began to argue with God? Can you imagine if God had to wait on man's permission? We will all be like Job, trying to tell God how to do his business. And God said to Job, in the straightened Job out concerning the same matter, where was you when I threw the lightning from the east to the west? Job, where was you when, when I did such and such a thing? In other words, God put man in his place. Even the Bible also says that in the last days that God said, I will shorten the very days because the, if I, he didn't do it, the very elect would not be saved. God did this, this uh, not because man said, Lord, we want you to shorten the days because we know we're not going to make it. No, God said, I'm going to do this because I know you're not going to make it. So there is so much indication uh, where God does not need man. That's almost like saying that the, the creator is subject to the creation. Uh, to, to the creation. So we want to really be very careful. And I, I, again, I've seen a couple of people pushing this horrible teaching um, to me. Um, and we don't want to get into that. Uh, if you're going to say you're going to give God all the glory, give God all the praise. And the Bible warns us about taking the glory uh, away from away from God. So now, so I just wanted to go over that. Um, and, and the main thing is to think about the scripture I just quoted. Oh, Lord, how much? I don't see how this noise going on up here. Okay. Um, that God, again, shortening the days. 
this is for our protection. We got to recognize God is covering us. We're not covering God. Please do not say that God needs your permission to do things on earth because we're not omniscient. We don't, we don't know everything. That, that's a, I mean, that will put us in a horrible place. Satan would love for us to believe that, that God is handicapped mm -hmm. by his own creation. Mm -hmm. He would love for us to think that, that God can't do nothing without man. So at, at the devil's inside of man, then he's going to stop man from praying. And But you know what? Again, going back to that scripture I quoted, that when we can't pray as we are because we're perplexed, perspired, we're angry, we're mad, or we're possessed, or we're oppressed, the spirit of God still moves in our, our behalf. The Bible says that God reigns on the unjust as well as the just. That's all God. That has nothing to do with man. This is God's sovereign will that he reigns on the unjust as well as the just. And so there's, there's a lot, again, a scripture quotation that shows, especially in the last days, if you're, if you're studying revelations right now along with us, there's nothing in there that God is, is doing, opening up seals that where he needs man. He is showing man, but he's not asking John's permission about nothing. Show me where he asked John's permission uh, uh, to open up the seals. Show me where he asked anyone permission. No one revelation that God asked anything. He's just showing. That's it. Man, where permission is not needed. He's given man an opportunity now to choose. Yes, God is not going to force you to serve him. But but let me share this with you. The reason why um, this is what uh, Miles Monroe said. Miles Monroe said, well, if God didn't need man permission and if, if God was omniscient and all-powerful and all this, why did he let the little old woman uh, take a bite of the apple? Why couldn't he stop her? He said, well, he couldn't stop her. He didn't, you know, and so that and that blew my mind. He said he couldn't stop her. To me, and I know some of y'all love Miles Rowe, and I love him too, but to me, that's, that's total ignorance. God wanted, that was part of the fulfillment. She, what she did was nothing short of a part of God's plan to <laughs> redeem man. He knew that Satan was going to tempt her. He knew that Satan was going to happen. All of that was a part of God's plan. So her doing that did not shock him or surprise him or hurt his feelings. He knew all of this. And how we as, a, uh, as great leaders don't realize, and, and the Bible says we have the mind of God, according to Romans or Corinthians, we have the mind of God. If we have any mind of God, we have to know that there is nothing that man can do that God is not already Aware. The, the Bible said that man's life is already predestined. As man's life is already predestined, then there's nothing that we can pray about that God didn't already know the answer before you pray. If, if you be, believe in predestination, that means that our life is already mapped out. If it's already mapped out, it's mapped out before you pray. God already knows what he can do before you even pray. So whether you pray or not, God's going to still be God. So, so, so again, to believe that is to take out predestination and, and so forth. Now, I just want to make sure that I deal with that because I hear it too much. I looked online. I was looking online while the class was going on, just checking it out again. And so, but, okay. Thank you, ladies. You've done an awesome job. <laughs> Dr. Short. Yes. You asked me a question. That wasn't what I said. What I said was, I don't believe that God does anything on earth now without using us. I didn't say he needed our permission to do anything. I just don't believe that he don't do anything without using us, using mankind. That's that's what I said. Well, I can, even, even with that statement, I would still disagree that there are times okay, that God, okay. yeah, um, there's too, there too many scriptures uh, where God ha did not use man, but just sent his Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus said, when I'm going to okay. I'm going to send another comforter. He didn't say another man, another woman. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send another part of myself. There's, he uses man, but God, but God forbid it for us to ever think that God, that God needs us for anything. We need the Holy Spirit. Okay, but anyway, thanks okay. for God. Okay. Anyway. Um, yeah. I want to clarify too, fourth on my teaching. Um, this is when I was talking about the 100... One one hundred and forty-four thousand. This is like happening now. I'm not talking in past tense. I'm talking about like in current okay. tense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, so um, what we want to do, we don't, we didn't pick anyone for chapter eight. Um, now someone, if we did, please speak up. I don't think we did. I think we stopped at you, Myra. Yes. I think we stopped at you. Okay, so I'm going to finish this out. But I do, for those of you that missed class on Thursday night and part of last week, I did apologize. I put an apology out there that we are going to have a test. The reason why we're going to have to have a test is because everybody's not going to be able to teach. I can't really assess everybody. We have uh, 15 people in this class, uh, pretty much. Uh, and there's no way that I can have 14, 13, 14 people teach the whole book of Revelation will not get done. And the things that I want to bring out, I'm not going to be able to bring out if I do that. So I do apologize, but we are constructing a mild mid test that will be coming out on Thursday. So please check your emails on Thursday. You will have a mid test. So you want to go over we're going to, uh, videos one, two, three, four, uh, and five. Uh, as a matter of fact, this video, this video here, uh, actually will not be on the test. Nothing that was said here tonight will be on the test. We're going to use this in the second part. We've actually started the second part of this uh, of this course now. This is week five, so the test is only through week four. Okay, the test is only. Um, okay, so now if you have any questions concerning again uh chapter one two most of your questions are going to probably come out of chapter uh excuse me week one week two and uh week three okay i'm, I'm looking up something okay anyone else have any questions before we uh close out and and prepare for dismissal. Okay, so uh, again, ladies, again, thank you very much. You will, um, I'm not going to uh, grade this because we're gonna use the mid test now. Um, and so those of you that, um, but you will get credit for this though. So we will give you credit uh, upon this. And so if you didn't, don't get a good grade on your test, this is gonna help you out because you're gonna get credit and we appreciate your assignment. I do wanna say this because I did it with Sister Dina and it wouldn't be fair if I don't, if I don't mention it again and again and again. Um, Sister Dina, a man, Apostle CQ. Didn't you, was that you, Sister Dina? Did you say amen? No, I did not, sir. You did not? Okay, I heard an amen from someone. It's not me. Okay. Amen. I apologize. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be surprised no with you because we talked about that. Okay. It was not me. <laughs> okay, okay. I apologize. It wasn't you. Okay, I, I want to say, say this. I want to say this. Is that we want to, the, the, the thing that I see most of uh, that, takes place, and I did talk to Sister Dino about this, is that um, what I see mo out of most students, not all of you, because some of you, your articulation is good, try not to be preachy, okay? Try not to be preachy, because it's hard to get questions. It's hard enough to get people to say something anyway, but especially when we're, when we're preachy, we don't want to do that. So go back and listen to the videos. Those of you that have taught, listen to yourselves. I do it all the time. I listen to myself. I make corrections and things righteous. But again, um, I, I, I've been doing this the whole time for me not to uh, mention something when I uh, brought a, little, a slight correction, but everybody else would not even be fair to those that came before. So, but pretty much that's it. And I think you didn't take long at all. So that was fine. And so, uh, but any of you teachers, uh, Apostle CQ or uh, uh, Minister uh, Skelton, do you have any? Do you have any other final statements before we close out? No, thank you. Okay, okay. So um, I did. Did you make any? Uh, Samara, did you make any amendments? I know you sent me your uh, your worksheet. Did you? Did you make any amendments to that at all? Um, I did add some to it that I talked about. I can add it to it and, and send it in. Yes, please send it. I thought you did. Uh, so I'll send that, uh, even though it may be slight, but send okay. it in so, so I can add the full thing. Okay, right. so, so next week I will be in chapter eight and nine. Next week I tend to cover chapter eight and chapter nine. So uh, those of you that, again, 
that are on here that, that's a part of the class. We, I'm looking, we do have a couple of guests. Uh, we will be taking the test on Thursday night. If you have any other co questions, comments, or statements, call me tomorrow because I asked you now. So don't call me later, please. I asked now to ask, not later, okay? It's Dr. Short's time. God bless you. Have a smile upon you. Love you. In Jesus' name, we'll talk to you guys on tomorrow. Be blessed. Bye-bye.